Hello and welcome to our presentation titled Effect of Matrix Viscoelasticity on pH Resistivity of Carbon Nanotube Polymer Composites. My name is Wolfgang Klim and I'm with the Structures and Materials Design Laboratory of Dr. Kawai Kwok at the University of Central Florida. Before I begin, I would like to give you a quick outline of this presentation. I'll start with a brief introduction to pH resistive nanocomposites and their potential applications. I will continue by highlighting remaining problems that emerged from recent experimental studies and define the scope of this research study. Then I will briefly introduce the representative volume element approach we have developed previously and that will serve as a modeling platform for the following studies. I will also briefly cover the additional complexity of viscoelasticity in the three-dimensional case in which common assumptions are made when only limited material data from experiments are available. And finally, we will uh, look at the preliminary results and see how a viscoelastic polymer matrix can influence the strain sensing behavior and which consequences that has for reliable long-term sensing. Let me start with a brief introduction into piezo-resistive nanocomposites. This class of materials combines electrically insulating materials such as polymers or ceramics with highly conductive filler materials, as for instance carbon nanotubes, graphene platelets or carbon black, to form a conducting microstructure. The conductivity of the microstructure is highly sensitive to deformations and thus can be utilized in strain sensing. Possible applications include shape sensing in deployable structures, motion sensors as seen in the upper right corner, and more general structural health monitoring as depicted in the lower figure. Here a carbon nanotube yarn is utilized for strain sensing and carbon fiber tows. These examples uh, emphasize the highly varying influence of time on the sensor characterization, since motion sensing is an ultra-rapid process, for example, compared to the usually slow deployment of space structures or even slower long-term structural health monitoring. Consequently, the magnitude of viscoelastic effects varies greatly across these different applications. This brings us to the challenges of nanocomposites. Recent experimental studies have demonstrated a decay of the peak sensing and cyclic tensile tests as illustrated in the figure on the right. This behavior was attributed to nonlinearities in the sensor behavior as well as plasticity and viscoelasticity in the matrix. However, other experimental studies did not observe the decay of the sensor sensitivity. In fact, Kao and his colleagues could show that a carbon nanotube epoxy composite exhibits linear behavior up to a plateau in the relative resistance change between 5 and 7%. This plateau was followed by a decay of the relative resistance change beyond the plateau and up to the failure strain of 13%. The follow-up cyclic studies showed perfectly repeatable behavior for an upper strain level of 2 and 4% respectively. However, the cyclic tests achieving upper strain levels of 6 and 8% exhibited the decay of the sensor sensitivity with each cycle. These findings suggest a bigger influence of permanent matrix deformation on the sensor sensitivity than viscoelasticity. In order to prove this theory, the study will strategically investigate the influence of matrix viscoelasticity on the sensor sensitivity in the absence of permanent deformations with a previously developed representative volume element. The RVE is utilized to investigate two load cases under the two common assumptions for viscoelastic materials, namely a constant linear elastic bulk modulus or a constant Poisson ratio. Let's talk about the representative volume element next, which is illustrated on the right-hand side. The RVE consists of a cubic volume filled with a statistical conductor network. The position and orientation are created randomly for a desired volume fraction. Then the analysis is split into two steps. First, a mechanical finite element model is created where the carbon nanotubes are modeled with truss elements and embedded in brick elements with the viscoelastic properties of the matrix. The deformation is then applied to the matrix nodes and the coupling between nanotube nodes and matrix nodes ensures the deformation of the conducting network. In the second step, the matrix elements are omitted and only the conductive network is modeled for an electric analysis step. For this purpose, a potential difference is pres prescribed between two phases and the resulting potential and current density distribution is calculated by the finite element solver. The, the color scheme on the right hand side represents the resulting potential when 10 volt and 0 volt are prescribed on the two outer phases respectively. The change in the network conductivity mainly stems from the distance change in the tunneling pairs, which can be calculated with Simmons equation. Here di represents the surface distance between two carbon nanotubes. Since the surface distance also appears in the exponential term, the total resistance of a tunneling pair is highly sensitive to external deformations. For more detailed descriptions of this approach and validation of the model, please refer to our paper that is currently under review. In the three-dimensional general case, additional information beyond the relaxation modulus is required to describe the mechanical behavior fully. In the elastic case, the Poisson ratio is often chosen as the additional parameter and assumed to be constant. However, this is overly simplified in the viscoelastic domain and leads to the same relative relaxation of the bulk 
relaxation modulus and the shear relaxation modulus. Another common option for viscoelastic polymers, though, is the assumption of a constant bulk modulus, which is often closer to reality since the relaxation under hydrostatic pressure is very small. These assumptions are necessary since often not enough data is available to determine bulk and shear relaxation modulus independently. The first equation here links the deviatoric stress by means of a convolutional integral to the shear relaxation modulus and the deviatoric strains, whereas the second equation provides the same relationship for the hydrostatic stresses, bulk relaxation modulus, and hydrostatic strains. These are the equations utilized by the finite element model and pony series are used to represent the shear relaxation and bulk relaxation modulus respectively. The first investigated load case consists of a uniaxial extension along the x-direction over one second, followed by a 24-hour stress relaxation simulated as a viscous step and is finalized by the removal of the strain and the creep recovery over 1000 seconds. The focus here lies on the influence of the transverse strain during the stress relaxation step and how it influences the resistance in the axial direction. The table on the lower left-hand side summarizes the simulation parameters. The second investigated load case comprises the cyclic tensile loading. The upper strain level for the epoxy was 0.4% since the fracture strain is about 2.7% for this material. The strain is applied over 80 seconds and removed over 80 seconds. This is repeated for six cycles first. The focus here lies on the repeatability of the peak sensing. On the left hand side we see the relative resistance change over strain for the first load case and the assumption of a constant bulk modulus. The upper inset clearly shows the decrease of the resistance change as a vertical line during the stress relaxation where the axial strain is held constant. This behavior stems from the increasing compaction in the two transverse directions and indicates the loss of uniqueness in the relationship between relative resistance change and strain. The inset on the lower left shows the relative resistance change during the creep recovery step. Here, the relative resistance change is also slightly lower than during the initial loading phase due to the increased transverse compaction. This behavior is not observed when a constant Poinsot ratio is assumed. On the right side, we see the corresponding strain energy density. Despite, despite the increasing transverse compaction, the total strain energy still decreases due to the stress relaxation. The recovery portion in the lower left corner indicates a return to a state of almost zero strain. Here we see the results of the second load case for each material model. The green color represents the applied strain and the black curves the relative resistance change. No decay of the peak sensing is visible here. Thus we take a look at the numerical values for each material model under cyclic loading. The table on the left hand side shows the peak and valley sensing values for the assumption of a constant bulk modulus. I would like to bring your attention particularly to the third column which represents the relative change of the peak sensing at peak I compared to the first peak. This value measures the repeatability of the peak sensing. A small but decaying trend can be observed here. The same decay cannot be observed for the assumption of a constant Poinçon ratio represented by the table on the right hand side and the third column. These observations underline the influence of the transverse behavior on the sensing capacities observed in the first load case. For that purpose, a longer cyclic load case with 25 repetitions was simulated under the assumption of a constant bulk modulus. The relative resistance change of peak sensing and the transverse strain at each peak are illustrated in the figure on the right. The reasons for the reduced sensing capability are the same as in the first load case, namely an increased transverse compaction due to a non-constant Poinsot ratio. The magnitude, however, is small since the investigated material at room temperature is far from its glass transition temperature of 240 degrees Celsius, but can grow considerably for higher temperatures or materials closer to their glass transition temperature. And this brings me to our conclusion. First, I would like to highlight again that a non-constant Poinsot ratio over time leads to the loss of the unique relationship between axial strain and resistance change according to the preliminary investigations. Consequently, the answer whether viscoelasticity can be responsible for reduced sensing capability has to be answered with yes. In addition, the influence of the transverse compaction persists when the bulk relaxation modulus relaxes slower than the shear relaxation modulus, getting rid of the assumption of a constant bulk modulus. The next steps include the fitting of the shear and re uh, bulk relaxation modulus from uniaxial tension tests and the implementation of the, of the refined material model into the fine element simulations. And with this slide, I'd like to finalize the presentation, Effect of Matrix Viscoelasticity on pH resistivity 
of carbon nanotube polymer composites. I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions during our designated questions and answer session on January 12th.